I became pregnant at 14 through incest. A cousin who was supposed to be babysitting me thought it would be a better idea to have sex with me. And this was in the 1960s. So I had very, very few options at that time. Abortion was not legal, but you could imagine that that was not my choice for how I would become a mother. So my only option at that time, as I saw it, was to have my baby and give him up for adoption. And that was very common back then, that when girls became pregnant, they would slide us off to some little hidden place. For me, it was a home for unwed mothers. And then we'd have our babies, we'd give them up for adoption, and then we'd return to high school pretending that we'd just been on extended vacations. Except something went interestingly wrong. The day after my son was born, the nurses made what I always assumed was a mistake, and they bought me my son. And I looked down, and I saw his face, and he had my face. I kept saying, he's got my face. He's got my face. Oh, shit, he's got my face. And I found that I couldn't go through with the adoption. And so all the plans I made about going back to school and pretending that I could put all of this behind me and all of that just suddenly went out the window when in that morning in that hospital I made a decision to parent the child of my rapist. So for 45 years I've been tethered to my rapist, which is a very interesting way to parent, to say the least. And my son has had to deal with the fact that his father is by no means perfect, was a pedophile. He also is dead now, but he was a pedophile. My son had to deal with that. So we've had a very complicated story, but I really don't regret keeping my son because a few years later I was sterilized by a a doctor who felt that I'd already had a kid. So... It turns out that the child I had was my only chance to become a parent. So my when and where I enter story is that I entered this movement being pissed off by not having choices. Because no young girl should be sexually abused by a relative. And once that happens, I should still have choices over whether or not I choose to have a baby And then I should still have choices if I want to have further children. All of those choices were denied to me before I was even 19 years old. And so I took the rage. I internalized it for a long time. I probably am still internalizing it. You know, I've been in therapy for I don't know how long. So I was very lucky that when I went off to college, I went off to college in Washington, D.C., and in 1972, the very first rape crisis center in this country was founded, the D.C. Rape Crisis Center. And a girlfriend of mine who was in the Black Panther Party, Nakinji Ture, convinced me to go over to the Rape Crisis Center as a volunteer. And I told Nakinji, I don't want to go over there. I don't want to work with those white women. (laughs) And Nakinji went, Sister, you think a panther would lead you wrong? I was totally intimidated. I mean, this woman broke down weapons, and, you know, she was part of the Black Liberation Army. I was trying to figure out what oppression was. (laughs) You know? So thanks to the Kinji, I ended up over at the D.C. Rape Crisis Center. They taught me that what had happened to me had happened to thousands of other poor black women across the country, that I wasn't alone, that it was possible to recover from the drama and trauma of my life. They taught me what feminism was, and I've been a professional feminist ever since. So this is my when and where I enter story. And the whole process of claiming ownership, not only of your body, but claiming the necessary social and economic conditions to make sense of your life. Because ownership of your body is not enough. 
Yes, so you're not, quote, enslaved, but you can be enslaved by circumstances. You can be enslaved by a disabling environment. You can be enslaved by not having enough money to pay for your health care or your rent. So we have to talk about what does ownership of our body really mean and what are the necessary enabling conditions we need in order to truly say that it's ours. Since 1997, I've been involved with a group of women of color called Sister Song. One of the things that Sister Song has pioneered is the concept of reproductive justice. Reproductive justice was actually invented by a group of black women in 1994. And I was fortunate enough to have been a part of those black women where we were in a hotel room in Chicago, just having returned from the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, Egypt. And what we found was that feminists from around the world were using the human rights framework to lay claim to a much more expansive set of rights than we were doing in the United States only using the privacy framework and the U.S. Constitution. That slaveholder document called the U.S. Constitution has never worked for including us. Actually, it's never worked for including anybody but property-owning white men. What we found when we got back from Cairo was that we were very dissatisfied with the isolation of abortion rights from social justice issues, from human rights issues. And this was done often inadvertently by the pro-choice movement, so much so that nowadays the majority of the American public doesn't even see abortion as medical care. They separate it like abortion shouldn't be part of health care reform. And we're like, well, hell, you don't go to an auto mechanic to have one. <laughs> you go to a medical practitioner. And we actually offered a critique of both the pro-choice and the pro-life movement because they don't really either understand how women actually live our lives. Meaning that every time a woman thinks she is pregnant, she doesn't even have to actually be pregnant, she just has to think she's pregnant. Like you missed your period and you go, oh my God. Oh my God, I'm late. Oh my God, what am I gonna tell my mother? Oh my God, what am I gonna tell my partner? Oh my God. Can I stay in school? Will I get fired from my job if I decide to keep this? Oh, my God. I mean, this is the real conversations that go on in women's heads. When that period is just a little bit late and you know you've been sexually active and you're like, oh, shit. the answers to those oh, my God conversations are going to determine whether she's ready to become a parent or not. If she doesn't have health care, if she's worried about getting battered by her partner, she may not be ready to become a parent. And so neither the pro-choice nor the pro-life side pays attention to the conditions in a woman's life before she becomes pregnant. They only take up the cause once she is pregnant. One trying to say, we're giving her choices, and the other saying, we're trying to take away her choices so that she has the baby. But if you don't pay attention to those oh my God considerations, you're not giving her choices that make sense. Because it's not a choice to continue a pregnancy if you fear violence, if you fear eviction, if you fear expulsion from school or loss of your job. That's not a choice. Isolating abortion from women's lived experiences, in our opinion, does not serve women well. And so once we discovered that the international movement was using the human rights framework, we came up with the concept of reproductive justice. And reproductive justice is basically the right to have a child, the right not to have a child, and the right to parent the children that you have in safe and healthy environments. 
Now, we say the right to have a child because we are from communities of color who are always subjected to strategies of population control, where our right to be mothers is often deeply contested. But we also join with the pro-choice movement in fighting for the right to abortion, to birth control, to sex education, to abstinence, if you can hold on. (laughs) So reproductive justice is not a way to avoid saying abortion. It just goes beyond abortion. And then we have to fight for the right to parent our children in safe and healthy environment, the right for incarcerated women to parent, the right for people who are disabled to express their parenting right, trans people to become parents. All of these rights to parent are ways that we have to fight for not only the expression of our desires, but to do so in safe and healthy environments. So that means that we have to fight against gun violence as part of the right to parent, fight against environmental toxins as part of the right to parent, fight against the school to prison pipeline, you know, fight against all these things that jeopardize our children and our right to parent because we take a much more holistic approach to what control over your body means because it's not just about your body, but it's about the enabling conditions that are necessary for you to have choices that make sense.